All right, you guys, welcome. Welcome to the 2020 Global Stock Pitch Competition for Young Investor Society. I'm so excited to see all of your faces today. Um, we have a great event uh, planned for this evening for you. We have our um, six teams um, from all over presenting this evening. We have Sophia and Jisoon from the International School of Kuala Lumpur. Hi, you guys in Malaysia. Uh, we have Yang Chin from Hong Kong over at Yowie College. And uh, Ethan Wilk from Arizona. Hi, Ethan. Siraj and Brant from Rhode Island. Hey, guys. Sarab and John from Virginia, and uh, Arjan and Abhinav um, from California. So great to see you guys all here. So excited for today. I'm going to give it over to our CEO and founder, James Fletcher. He's going to introduce our judges and give us a little bit of info about today. All right. Welcome, everyone. This is such a privilege to see your face. Um, I'm James Fletcher, founder of Young Investor Society, and um, like to give a welcome to all of the students participating, um, the judges that are here, the regional advisory board members and board members across the world who tuned in, and to all the students tuning in on the YouTube channel. Welcome to everyone. This has been what a year. I mean, looking back at, at this year, who would have even imagined that we would be going through COVID-19 and school shutdowns and cancellations but at the same time, who would have imagined that we'd still be able to have our global stock pitch competition? The quality and the caliber of the stock pitches this year has just been amazing. Um, we say it every year that it, it gets um, better every year. And this year was definitely the truth. The caliber, the quality, the professionalism of, of these stock pitches. Um, uh, first off, I'd like to just say congratulations to each of you. The six winning teams that made it to this point. This is the result of um, state competitions, regional competitions, and, and now you're here competing in the global stock pitch competition. Um, before we get started, I would like just to give a short message. Um, I hope you learned something about yourself this year. Um, and, and I think over these past couple months, think about the things that you have learned about yourself. Um, that you can do hard things. And I think the thing that probably stands out to you is just the word resilience. Um, remember that you are resilient. Remember that in the face of everything that has, has come across your plate, um, you have still managed to prepare an amazing stock pitch competition, um, compete in, in your region, advance, compete again, and I hope that you personally remember that you are a resilient person, that you can do hard things, that you remember this lesson and take it with you in, in all of your future endeavors. Life, life has a way of, of always throwing adversity at us. And it's the people that can deal with adversity and make the best of it and still do their best. These are the people that succeed in the long run. And each of you here tonight you are those people that are resilient and that can push through. So first off, I would just like to give you my congratulations to all the teams that are participating. I would like to announce the judges. So I will announce their names. And then if we could turn um, 20 seconds over to each judge and have them introduce themselves. We have an incredible panel of judges here with you tonight. And we also have, as a guest speaker who will speak to us later, um, uh, Mr. Paul Smith, former CEO and president of the CFA Institute. Um, so if I could just, um, in this order, if we could have Tim Costanza, uh, managing director and head of, in, head of business development at Touchstone Investments, introduce himself. And then we'll have Andy Davis, um, wealth advisor at Wealth Source, where he owns his own RIA and Amar Gill, Managing Director of Investor Stewardship at BlackRock. Um, so if we could have Tim introduce himself and then Andy and then Amar, and then um, back over to Christine. Sure, well, nice to meet everyone. And uh, I apologize, I'm on week 10 of working from home. So I'm, I'm a little bit less formal today, um, but I, I uh, do work for Touchstone Investments. I'm on our institutional sales team. And if you're not familiar with us, uh, we are a mutual fund company. 
um, CFA charter holder. So I, I do consider myself a student of the markets and uh, I've read and seen a number of these presentations. So I'm excited to uh, see these finalists tonight because I, I think all of you are a lot further along than I was at your age. So it's nice to see. I'll go next, uh, Andy Davis. I'm a financial planner and investment advisor in Southern California. Uh, the first 10 years of my career, I spent on the asset management side, uh, working with uh, folks like James Fletcher and uh, got to uh, learn some amazing uh, principles and fundamentals of investing. And uh, I congratulate all of you for uh, going through the program because uh, this is some, some pretty amazing stuff that, that you're able to take with you the rest of your lives. So, uh, Congrats and, and great work to all of you. Look forward to the presentations tonight. Hi, I'm Amar Gill. Um, I'm based in Hong Kong um, with BlackRock, uh, which uh, obviously is a, an American uh, company that is going global. And uh, I'm, I'm in charge of investment stewardship, which is basically uh, uh, corporate governance of the companies that uh, BlackRock is invested in. Uh, but I have been a sales side analyst uh, for over 20 years, uh, most of my career with a firm called CLSA. Um, I've looked at uh, the, the reports that have been produced uh, for this finalist, um, for the, by the finalists today, very high quality. Looking forward to, uh, uh, to hearing your presentations. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, well, without further ado, I'm going to give you guys the order of our presentations this evening. Um, first off, I have our international schools um, because they actually have to get to school today. So they have asked to go first. So first is the International School of Kuala Lumpur. We have Sophia and Jisun. Second will be Yang Chin from Hong Kong. Third this evening is Ethan Wilk from Arizona. Fourth, Siraj and Brant from Rhode Island. Fourth, Saurabh and John from Virginia. And last but not least, Arjan and Abhinav from California. So we actually have six teams total tonight. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. This is the way we're going to present this evening. We're gonna have you guys have 10 minutes on our clock uh, to do your presentation. You're gonna be sharing your screen with all of us with your PowerPoint presentation. You're gonna go through your pitch, uh, just like we did in our regional events. And um, the judges will ask you a series of questions. We're gonna limit it to about two questions for our judges today. Um, and we're going to take turns with the judges asking you questions. Um, after that, we're gonna move on to the next presenter. Um, does anyone have any questions? Pretty straightforward, everyone's done this before. Excellent. All right, you guys, well, I'm gonna start with um, Sophia and Jisoo, you guys are up. Um, I think it says host disabled screen sharing. Um, you should, there's a little green button on the bottom where you can share. It's saying, um, I think host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, okay. No, got it. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Do you see, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, let's go. Hello, my name is Sophia Lee. My name is Ji Suan. Today we'll be presenting on investment case on Sandstorm Gold. We believe that Sandstorm Gold is a strong buy for these reasons. Firstly, Sandstorm has an incredibly powerful business model with twin optionality to expansion and gold price appreciation. Secondly, we're extremely bullish on gold as we believe that the macroeconomic conditions are favorable to gold. Thirdly, Sandstorm is a growth focused company that standing management team and we believe there are significant upside benefits to Sandstorm. And thirdly, 
Um, sandstone, adding sandstone to your investment portfolio has significant diversification benefits. Therefore, we, our target price for sandstone is 27 US dollars with a 360% a upside. Sandstone Gold is a gold royalty company with 190 assets globally. In return for providing money to gold mining companies, Sandstone receives a share of royalty income and gold streams at a discounted gold price. So what are gold royalty companies? Gold royalty companies operate based on a contract where a gold royalty company receives a percentage of revenue or gold production in return for offer payments. Royalties are notably different from streaming companies. Instead of receiving a percentage of revenue or gold production, a streaming company purchases all or a part of gold at a predetermined price. This price is set lower than the current gold, gold spot price, so the royalty or streaming companies can then sell the gold for profit at current market value. This chart shows how gold royalty companies are a better investment than physical gold or gold mining companies. Not only are there zero capital expenditure costs, but royalty companies also have a free exploration and expansion upside, which we'll explain for more further on. In summary, gold royalty companies represent an attractive return to risk profile and the gold royalty company sits between the gold operating companies and physical gold in terms of risks. The first reason why we believe Sandstorm is a strong buy is because of its incredibly powerful business model. As a debt-free gold royalty company, Sandstorm's asset light business model provides a diversified flow of royalty income from over 190 royalty streams globally. It's unique in the sense that Sandstorm does not operate the gold mines directly, so there's no maintenance or capital expenditure costs, and it's also free from political or environmental risk. Because Sandstorm does not explore for new mines directly, um, they, it's often less capital intensive and less risky. So instead, Sandstorm has a broad and diverse portfolio of royalties and streams, whilst minimizing direct involvement in operations. A crucial part of Sandstorm's business model, which makes it truly powerful, is its free optionality to further exploration. So when Sandstorm buys a royalty, what they end up with is a perpetual option on the discoveries made on the land by the operators. So when they buy a royalty on a piece of land for, let's say there's 5 million ounces of mineable reserve, in 90% of the cases, the company will mine those 5 million ounces will discover another 5 million and will mine another 5 million. But for the shareholders, all you've paid for is for the first five. So you get the second for free. This chart shows the industry leader, Frank and Nevada, and it shows how leveraged the earnings can be to the gold price, even when the gold price is flat, outperforming both gold mines and physical gold. It's a free perpetual option to, sharehold, to equity shareholders. The second reason why we believe that Sandstorm is a strong buy is because of the macroeconomic conditions. Gold has been a store of value and an inflation hedge for centuries for two main reasons. Firstly, gold is traditionally a good monetary asset and this history makes gold appealing in times of crisis. Secondly, the value of gold cannot be debased by governments or central banks. Therefore, when investors lose confidence in fiat currencies such as the US dollar, Gold and other commodities tend to gain a currency premium. And right now we are in a time of crisis. With the COVID-19 pandemic has caused governments around the world to embark on fiscal stimulus. As shown in these graphs, the US fiscal deficit is expected to widen to 18% of GDP in 2020. And increasing quantitative easing programs by central banks has pushed the Fed and ECB balance sheets to almost 6 trillion US dollars. This is unprecedented and extremely positive for the outlook of gold. If concerns regarding future inflation and dollar weakness continue to grow, then investors may turn to gold and other commodities as a store of value, thereby increasing the price of gold. In summary, there are many demand drivers that pressure on gold as shown in this chart, which are likely to drive the gold price up. We're very bullish on gold as this graph shows the potential exponential increase in the gold price if it 
follows this bull market pattern from 1970 to 1977. If the gold price were to follow this pattern, and then sandstone share price could also be exponential. The third reason why we believe sandstone is a strong buy is because sandstone has grown consistently every year since the company was founded. Their strong track record of success positions Sandstorm as a company with high growth potential, even in a flat gold environment. In a span of nine years, Sandstorm has increased their revenue from 3 million US dollars to 89 million US dollars. On top of this, future gold mine projections are expected to rise by 115% by 2023, which will enable the company to reach their cash flow, 2023 cash flow forecast of 140 million US dollars. Sandstorm's management team are superb in that they are run by CEO Nolan Watson, who is the former CFO at Regent Precious Metals. Nolan Watson has 60% of his personal net wealth in Sandstorm stock. He's clearly aligned with shareholders. The fourth reason why Sandstorm Gold is a strong buy is the diversification benefits of adding the stock into an investment portfolio. Gold has proven to provide diversification in portfolio due to its low correlation to other financial assets, as shown in the graph on the left. In fact, by having 5 to 10% gold in a 60 to 40 balance portfolio, returns have been enhanced and the volatility has reduced, according to the second graph. Now on to the financial analysis and valuation. As shown in Morningstar's analysis, Sandstorm is currently 14 undervalued by 14%. And as shown in their EV to EBITDA, they are also projected to continue trading at a discount compared to the sector. Although Sandstorm's consensus forward PE ratio is high at 68, their large EBITDA margins at 70% shows um, projected growth, asset light model. Um, this all reflects the high moats and defensive qualities of the royalty sector. In addition, Sandstorm's asset base is diversified. The company is debt-free and free from operational and financial risks associated with gold mining, as there are no capital expenditure costs, hence the higher absolute valuation compared to the market. Our current target price for Sandstorm is $27. US dollars. We calculated this by comparing Sandstorm's forecasted cash flow yield to the industry leader, Frank Nevada. However, to be on the conservative side, we assumed a 50% discount to Franco Nevada, valuing Sandstorm at 27 US dollars, representing a 3.6 times upside from the current share price. Note that this is assuming a flat gold price. There are four investments please. First, if the gold price falls, then it could impact the gold mining revenues and therefore the gold royalty and streaming companies. Second, these junior mines could pose a risk as they are smaller companies that may have less experience and lack of financial resources. Third, Sandstorm has a high P ratio, which shows that Sandstorm is quite expensive. Fourth, uh, political tax raises or environmental concerns could pose a risk to the gold mining um, companies. We believe that Sandstorm can triple from the current price because of new mines and royalties coming on stream even when the gold price is flat. Not only does Sandstorm have an option on further gold mine expansion, but they also have an option on the gold price itself, which if it follows the 1975 um, gold pattern as shown here, Sandstorm share price could increase tenfold. How many companies can you buy that seen positive earning upgrades has potential for tenfold returns with truly limited downside. Therefore, to quote Pierre Lassonde, this business model of stable royalty income plus upside optionality is potentially the most powerful business model ever created. I'm sure you agree that Sandstorm Gold is a strong buy. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, thanks you guys. I'm gonna hand it over to Tim. Tim, did you have any questions um, for Sophia and Jisoo? Take myself off. Can you hear me? Yep. So I, I am just curious if you walk me through how, how did you get to your target price again? I, I think it was on those last few slides, but maybe go into a little more depth on that. 
So we took the, um, the forecasted free cash flow of, um, of Sandstorm, and we also took it from Franco Nevada, and then we calculated the ratio, and then from there we got our, our upside from there. And we also took a 50% discount on Franco Nevada, because Franco Nevada is obviously a lot bigger than Sandstorm. And what time frame uh, do you expect uh, that? This is for 2023. 2020, okay, so the next three years. Mm -hmm. I, can I ask more questions? <laughs> uh, sure, one more. <laughs> um, uh, and then just kind of your general thoughts. It's, it sounds like you, you don't necessarily have to have an opinion on gold. Is that correct? Not necessarily, because our target price is even if the gold price stays flat. At, I think we, for the, we calculated at um, 1,600 US dollars. The gold if, if, sorry, what, follow up question. If gold goes down, it should it doesn't change your thesis. Oh, so if gold goes down, we actually contacted investor relations about this question, um, and they said that if the gold price goes up by twenty five percent, then their free cash flow would also go up by twenty five percent. But if the gold price goes down by twenty five percent, their free cash flow would go down by twenty four percent, would decrease by twenty four. Excellent. Andy, did you have a question for Sophia and Jisoo? I do. Uh, I actually want to know a little bit more about where they sit in the capital structure. So if they give uh, a miner money for in exchange for royalties and the miner goes out of business, I understand it doesn't necessarily impact this company but do they have any sort of uh, recourse? Can they, can they get part of their investment back if this uh, miner goes out of business and they have to sell all their assets? Do they get like 20 cents on the dollar? Like if you're a bondholder of this company, then you would probably be a little bit higher up the capital structure. I'm just curious to know if, if it works like that in this scenario, because I'm not real familiar with royalties? Well, Sandstorm does a lot of contracts with a lot of different, like over 190 different, um, they have a lot of different um, assets. And so I'm, I'm assuming that it would be a different contract for each company because they negotiate an individual contract for every single asset. So have did they ever, could you find out if anybody went out of business, whatever happened to their investment in that scenario, or is that not anything? <laughs> Really well, we haven't in your research. We haven't found any case of that. But uh, even though even though it happens, Sandstorm has a diversified portfolio, so uh, sure. it shares the risk. Okay. Good. Thank Amar, you. Amar, did you have anything for uh, Sophia and Jisoo? Well, actually, it was a follow-up question on what Andy was asking. The track record of this company uh, in terms of how many of the investments that it's made in gold mining companies in the last five years or eight years since it's been in operations, how many of its investments have turned out to be duds? Sorry, could you repeat the last part of the question again? How many of the investments that it has made over, the, over its business uh, operating period, last eight years, I believe, um, have turned out to be failures? What's the track record of the company? I'm actually not sure about how many um, contracts have, we turn out to be failures, but we do know that from their financial figures that even if some were failures and some were successes, because as Jesus said, the diversified portfolio, it allows them to be successful and still generate revenue, even if there are potentially some failures. And, and one, one, other one other question, if I can. So my, my second question is, how does the company finance itself? How does Sandstorm get the capital that it provides to the gold mining companies? Um, I, th I think mostly from shareholders. Um, they, so they, they obviously they're listed, so they get m most of their capital from shareholders and they use that to invest in, in, the, in the gold mining companies. So there's no bond, it doesn't have any debt. 
yeah, has, has there's, there's, there's no capital expenditure um, involved in the process because they're just they're just negotiating a contract. So they, um, the gold mine will have um, kind of capital expenditure costs for the equipment and all that, but because they only just have a contract with them, there's no yeah, there's no capital expenditure debt free involved. All right, thanks, uh, Sophia and Jisoo. I'm going to be moving on to Yang Chin from Hong Kong. Yang, are you ready? Uh, I'm ready, but I think I need to set something in my... I should restart my PowerPoint because the, the sharing screen needs to let me set something so give me a moment yang if you can't get it i can pull it up um, so no because i'm opening my powerpoints because um, they say if I need to share my PowerPoint with you or I need to make some settings. I love the NVIDIA background, by the way. Yang Ching, it is it is great to see you again. We just as a just as a, a mentioned for everyone online, we did a Hong Kong investment symposium this year. We had uh, over a hundred kids from twenty one different schools in in Hong Kong participating, and um, Yang Ching, I, I had so many good questions for all of the speakers that were there, um, even even so much that. Um, there was a portfolio manager that taught a class that afterwards said, said have Yang Ching send me his resume. He is very bright. So um, it's great to see you again. It's great to see that you made it to the global finals and hopefully uh, we can get the PowerPoint shared. Yang, yeah, I'm going to share uh, for you if you don't mind. Okay, okay. Can, but um, I thought it closed the Zoom first because the, the, the system told me to close it too. So I will leave you for a moment and I will come back. All right, so I'm actually gonna skip Yang and I'm gonna to go to Ethan from Arizona. Ethan, are you ready? Uh, yeah, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so let me just share it then. Okay, you can see the screen and everything. All right, cool. Uh, so good morning. My name is Ethan Wilk, and today I will be presenting a very bullish outlook on uh, Lyft Incorporated, ticker LYFT. So ever since its IPO in March of last year, Lyft has been experiencing an age of adversity. It's worthwhile to investigate the causes for this downfall in order to determine whether it's justified. So what caused the fall? Well, first of all, Lyft had a very high IPO price of $72 a share, which gave the company a valuation of $20 billion. This high valuation led investors to uh, meet it with a brutal year-long sell-off. Secondly, the company reported an unprofitability by one uh, by one hundred and twenty-one point four million dollars in Q4 of 2019, which led many investors to believe that the company will never be able to become profitable again. Finally, the outbreak of COVID-19 has ravaged every corner of the market, but transportation has been hit particularly rough as Lyft has lost more than double the market from its peak this year low. So what makes Lyft a bargain instead of a bust at these low prices? Well, first of all, the company's got some remarkable financials. Its debt to equity is a mere 16.69, which is more than 300% lower than its top competitor Uber's at 51.63. While acquiring minimal debt, the company's been able to realize a revenue increase of 52% year over year from 2018 to 2019. Additionally, as a result of the company's pricey IPO, they were able to raise over $2.9 billion in cash, which is well, uh, much more than enough money to survive a recession and even to continue growing in the future. Now, uh, analysts also predict some 
sorry, analysts also predict some very promising figures for the company's future, including, uh, including a revenue expectation of $12.1 billion by 2025 for a compound annual growth rate of 21.5%, and they expect EPS to grow to $7.24 a share by 2025, which is a massive uptick from its currently negative EPS. Additionally, the company's levered cash flow is a remarkable $307.6 million, which demonstrates the company's ability to responsibly manage funds, as well as indicates a very promising future for their financials. Now, alongside the company's financials, uh, Lyft is one of the most unique business structures I've ever seen. For one, over two thirds of the company's very costs are variable, which means that they'll only be losing significant money if they're actually making significant money in the first place. Therefore, if no one's taking rides during the coronavirus, then the company will simply be losing less money. Additionally, to further cut on costs, Lyft's cars are the capital assets of the drivers, not the company. This allows them to avoid paying automobile uh, taxes and things like that. And additionally, because the drivers are not federally considered employees, they don't need to pay things like medical, uh, medical plans or retirement. Uh, finally, CFO Brian Roberts of Lyft has announced that the company plans to pull back on their $1.5 billion of research and development funding from 2019, as they're now able to finally realize the value of the non-current assets that they invested in in 2019. Now, as a result of the fears developed from the outbreak of COVID-19, investors have been massively selling off Lyft's shares. They've lost more than two times as much as the market from its peak, and shares are now trading at a mere $22 per share, which is a fourth of their original IPO price. It's all driven by investor fear, but as a responsible investor, we must consider their core profitable business structure and their strong financials to determine that Lyft is actually a bargain at these low prices instead of a bust. Now, the ride sharing industry as a whole also has some very high barriers to entry as a Porter's Five Forces analysis will show. First of all, the threat of new entrants is next to none due to brand recognition. Companies like Sidecar and Juno have already gone bankrupt in the past year due to an inability to compete with companies like Uber and Lyft. Additionally, in the case of a rising competitor, Lyft can always easily buy them out with their massive $2.9 billion cash cushion. Customer bargaining power for Lyft is also next to none because Lyft charges less on average than Uber does. And additionally, supplier bargaining power is similarly low because Lyft compensates its drivers $2 more per hour than Uber does, which lowers their turnover rate compared to Uber. And alongside doing this, they foster a culture of driver appreciation by introducing things such as the tip. Now, Uber is Lyft's main top competitor in the industry, but due to Lyft's superior management and their superior financial position, Lyft is expected to take over as the market leader within five years. Finally, the only direct substitute for ride sharing is, the, is taxis, and ride sharing is expected to take over the taxi industry within five years because ride sharing is on average cheaper than taxis are and they're uh, more user accessible. So let's talk about uh, Lyft's compensation model for its executives. At Lyft, executives are incentivized to make objective-based decisions because 99% of their compensation is given in the form of company equity. In doing so, uh, the CEOs and CFOs are encouraged to uh, make decisions in favor of profit and growth for the company down the line because if they want to make more money, they need to increase the company's share price, which is a very promising model for investors. Market takeover is also imminent in this industry because as a SWOT analysis shows down here, Lyft is in a stronger financial position, they have more flexibility, and this offers them more opportunities to expand than Uber. Uber, on the other hand, has expanded uh, internationally too rapidly, and they're now focusing on damage control as they face the legal repercussions for rapid expansion. Now, speaking of market absorption, let's take a look at the demand for ride sharing, as it is the reason that investors have been ravaging the company's share price. As you can see down here, Lyft's users have increased 23% year over year from 2018 to 2019. Now, additionally, demographers have noted that over the past five years, migration to urban centers has been increasing rapidly, and this trend is expected to hold for the next decade. In doing so, demand for public transportation will increase, and ride sharing will fill this demand because it is cheaper on average than taxis are, and additionally, it's uh, more user-friendly than uh, taxis. Now, Lyft is not only innovating for the present, but they're innovating for their future. They partnered with Alphabet, Google's uh, parent company, to produce the first driverless vehicles. Uh, so far, these vehicles have recorded stats that are safer, reporting a 90% reduction in accidents along the Las Vegas routes that use them. They're more coveted as they've witnessed a 1000% increase in orders for these driverless rides. And finally, they're more efficient with an 80% reduction in traffic congestion along the routes that use these cars. Now, in creating these driverless vehicles, Lyft will be able to heavily cut back on costs because in a driverless vehicle, there is no driver and as such, the company doesn't need to compensate anyone for doing the driving. 
Additionally, the company will be expanding their served available market because customers that never would have taken a ride before now can feel safer and more secure in these rides, which will offer uh, rides to a much, a much larger customer base than originally planned. Uh, this is a video from a journalist documenting her experience in one of these driverless cars. One thing I'm noticing as we're stopping and starting here at the lights on the Las Vegas Strip is how smooth the car is. Um, it just feels like Vernon here is a very careful driver. A car did just kind of cut in front of us pretty quickly and we did break, but it felt smooth and you know, we didn't get too close to it. Honestly, sitting in the back seat, if I weren't paying attention at all, I would have absolutely no idea that we were in a soft side of the car. So as you can see from the video, the journalist felt that the ride was smoother, safer, and overall just better than an actual car. Again, this will work to improve the company's served available market because as the journalist uh, discussed, customers that never would have felt safe or secure in these cars will now be open to trying them. So this leads us into the company valuation section of this report. Where will Lyft shares be priced in five years? Well, we can use analyst expectations with a 2025 revenue estimate of $12.1 billion dollars an EPS estimate of $7.24 a share, and then an income estimate of $2.06 billion by 2025, then we can use a standard PE ratio in the industry of 15 to determine that shares will be priced at $108.60 by 2025 for a 393.6% appreciation. Now, as with any investment, this one does come with some risks. First of all, California recently passed its AB5 law, which requires that companies like Uber and Lyft treat its drivers as uh, federal employees. In doing so, they need to pay things like retirement plans and medical insurance. And as of now, this has been a negligible cost on the balance sheet, but if adapted on a national scale, it could become uh, more costly. Lyft, however, does have contingency plans in place for such uh, development. Secondly, acquisition is becoming increasingly possible as General Motors has been uh, acquiring equity in Lyft and now it holds 9% in the company. It could easily buy them out given GM's cash holdings and Lyft's market valuation. And while this would predictably spike the share price, it would also complicate the investment plan given in this presentation. Finally, there's always a possibility that this corona-induced recession ex uh, extends beyond its expectations, which could cause Lyft to garner uh, more debt acquisition or more cash expenditures than previously expected. So thank you for listening to my presentation and I'll now be taking questions. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm gonna give it over to Tim. Tim, did you have any questions for Ethan? Uh, just one, and it's really, you know, it seems like Lyft and Uber are in a constant price war um, to give the lowest ride, cost ride in whatever markets they're competing in. How do you see that resolving itself? It seems like they're just at an impasse. And I'm curious yeah. if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, it's definitely true. And while Lyft's rides are cheaper on average than Uber's, it's by a margin of uh, around two cents. So it's uh, relatively negligible. But I think the important part in the takeover from Lyft to Uber is the fact that Uber, on top of having to engage in this price war with Lyft, they also have to focus on all the repercussions that arose, that uh, came out of their opportunity, their attempt to expand overseas rapidly into countries like Singapore and Europe and uh, now, because of all these different costs that they're having to pay for it, they really can't focus on actually expanding their user base within uh, the U.S. while Lyft is in a uh, superior finance uh, position to do so. Great. Thank you. Amar, did you have anything for Ethan? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, could you could you go into a little bit more detail how you got your estimate for where revenues are going to be in 2025 for this company and what level of earnings it will get on that on those revenues? Yeah, so uh, the estimations are all just based on analyst expectations for the company, but the key drivers in uh, this expansion are uh, Lyft's um, inevitable market takeover within the ride sharing industry their uh, higher barriers to entry for their company specifically and their uh, innovations into autonomous vehicles and that sort of thing. So while the company still is technically uh, in, the, in the red for its, um, its financial figures, 
It's expected to start becoming profitable by 2021 and moving into the future within five years, it'll become uh, rapidly more and more valued. And one follow-up question. Earlier on in the presentation, you were talking about levered cash flow. Um, I think in, 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 in sort of comparing its valuations with, with other companies. Um, why would you choose levered cash flow versus unlevered cash flow? So uh, I chose levered free cash flow because I felt that the figure was more represent more represent more representative of my uh, my opinion on the company. So while their free cash flow is actually uh, still negative, this uh, their levered free cash flow is tremendously positive. And I felt that this figure represented my opinion on the company in that uh, the reason that they're only in they're only negative currently is due to all of the investments that they made in 2019 and the uh, amount of investments that they had to make to actually get a hold against Uber. So I felt that the levered free cash flow was a superior figure to demonstrate here because it actually included um, more of a, a more uh, full image of the company for, uh, for this presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks. Um, I'm going to be moving on back to Hong Kong uh, with Yang. Yang, are you ready? Um, yes. Um, so I, I'm really sorry for the no, no worries. Failure. So um, I will start now. So um, good evening, everybody. I'm Yang Chenghen from Ningwa College, and the stock I'm going to pitch to you is Nvidia. So let me briefly introduce the company to you all. Um, the company has product lines for several major aspects such as gaming, AI, machine learning, server professional visualization and the autonomous car. So let's watch the following clips to learn more about the company's product and its technology. So um, in this clip, you can see the company's uh, ray tracing technology of NVIDIA, the difference with and without that. And you can see here, it shows that it offers the gamers a more realistic gaming experience. As the lights and shadows are displayed according to objects, the source of light and the location of the player. So, and in the next clip, we will see the autonomous car driving system. And the system can recognize traffic signals and traffic signs, which nowadays even Tesla system cannot, which makes their car cannot drive autonomously in cities areas. While NVIDIA's hardware can also proving its technological superiority. And also a major car manufacturer, Toyota from Japan, has signed a partnership with NVIDIA to develop their own autonomous car driving system. So let's move on to my investment thesis. So the company currently has the largest market share in the graphic card market. As you can see in the charts below, um, there's 76, about 76% uh, compared to AMD's about 13%. So it's about 5.8 times for AMD. And it also has far superior technology as said above, as the ray tracing technology was only released by AMD more than a year later. Also, the globe is going to invest and develop in the AI greatly, as shown in the charts here. You can see the AI intelligence revenue forecasted will rise yearly with a huge margin, as NVIDIA is a hardware supplier of the AI uh, hardware, so we can foresee this growth in sales also, the AR and CR gaming was also see a huge growth. The global market size was 11.35 billion in 2017, and it's projected to reach 571.42 billion by 2025, and also driving the sales up. And we also see a global development in cloud gaming as 5G and Wi-Fi 6 is popularizing, offering late latency transmission for gamers. And Microsoft, Google, and NVIDIA are all releasing their own platforms. Also, emerging markets offer huge growth potential. As developing countries have a huge growth of GNI and the price of computer declines gradually, so it will make the computers more affordable and therefore boost the sales. Okay, let's take a look at the company's competitive advantage. So as stated above, the company has the largest market share in the GPU sector, 
a far superior technology, and it is also an iconic GPU brand. It has a great reputation among gamers for its power and optimization for different games. The company is also famous in other fields such as AI and professional visualization hardware. The company also has a strong distribution network with collaboration with various board makers to distribute its products around the globe, enabling NVIDIA to focus on its core business. The company also enjoys the scale of economies, and it can get a lower cost in production, sourcing price of raw material and marketing, as the company has a higher negotiation power. Let's go on to the part of the financial analysis. As you can see here, all the statistics of NVIDIA is significantly better than its peer, AMD and Broadcom, uh, both in terms of profitability and liquidity, as you can see here. And the growth of NVIDIA is also significant. As you can see, the total revenue of NVIDIA grew from 6.9 billion in 2017 to around 12 billion in fiscal 2019, and representing an annual growth rate of 30.6%, and Forbes forecast the revenue to be around 15 billion by fiscal 2021, which reflects a growth rate of 28.8% from 2019. Now, let's move on to the risk of investment and things you may also consider. So firstly, currency risk. With 80% of sales from international markets, the company is negatively impacted when the US dollar strengthened. The demand can only decrease as the price increase or a lower profit margin if the price is fixed. So secondly, the risk in emerging markets um, the market growth rates of the emerging market can be slower than what is expected. And this could also experience political turmoil, currency instability, and market volatility. As you can see in um, a country in uh, South America, Venezuela, uh, do we see results and hyper inflation, which will also often be seen in the emerging markets, which will lower the demand for the product of NVIDIA and lower sales. However, the high demand for the the product of the company in the future could weather out those risks. Um, as the company is manufacturing chips for autonomous car, AR, AI, cloud gaming, and gaming, we can see a huge growth in the amount of those in the near future to weather out those risks. Now, let's go on to coronavirus. The company relied on China for sales and it accounts for 24% of its sales. And NVIDIA's partners such as ASUS, Sotec, and more as their product manufactured in China. The virus halts production and brought the economic recession globally, then therefore lowers the su supply and demand in the market and therefore lowers the revenue. The stock market also plummeted due to the public worrying about the economic future. However, you should also consider that the coronavirus usually only lasts for two months according to Chinese statistics, and Chinese factories are already going back to normal operation. And the Fed and many central banks have lowered interest rates and implemented quantitative easing measures and therefore increased the liquidity in the market. And also the uh, GPU are also required by researchers to obtain more knowledge from the disease to find a cure for them and therefore also increase sales and boost the company's reputation. And trade war. Um, you have a third there may be a further development in trade war if Trump got reelected, and he might continue the trade war with China or with another country. As the company relies a lot in overseas market, it could lower sales and revenue. However, the majority of the products of NVIDIA is outsourced and manufactured in Taiwan by TSMC in, in Sam, and in Korea by Samsung Electronics. Um, so it's easier for the company to escape the tariff imposed by both countries. We will also lower the risk. And lastly, um, the uh, price rise in silicon are uh, tightening in environmental regulation in China or Russia could drove the price of silicon skyrocketing as China alone accounts for over half of the supply. As chips are made from silicon, it would increase the cost of production and therefore lower the profit. However, the cost of silicon compared to the price of finished product with the chips is very low. A price rise of silicon will not affect the cost by a huge margin, so also lowering the risk. 
So let's move on to my valuation. My 2021 target price is $290 per share, uh, which um, the stock market recently have already exceeded it. And this represents a 61% upside from the current share price. And I arrived at my target price through the following assumption, a target, pool, target multiple of around 44%, uh, 44 times PE, which is the current PS average, a $6.64 earnings per share, and I deduct $10 from my valuation due to the coronavirus. My recommendation is a solid buy. Now, let's take a look at my recommendation for holding. I recommend holding a company's share for a longer period of time as the future prospect of the company is great and it's required a long period of time until the saturation of growth. I expect a positive growth in sales and profit in the future. As Ron Buffet has said, be greedy when others are fearful. As the stock is in a five month low, we should invest in the company and await the strong bounce. Um, so, any questions? All right, thanks so much, Yang. I'm gonna hand it over to Andy. Andy, do you have any questions? Now that the stock is $350 a share, what do you do? I will still hold it because the, the future prospect is great, yeah. All and right. see that there's AI development and the autonomous car, which is great, and it's huge demand in the future. So I will still recommend holding it. Great, thank you. Tim, did you have any questions for Yang? Um, so how do you make the assumption as far as the PE staying where it is? I mean, you know, certainly it's a, a growth company. It's, it's well liked, um, but that's just a real, real rich PE ratio. Um, what gives you the confidence it's going to stay there? Uh, because it's the current peers average. So the, the PE could rise because of the price, stock price rising now. So, um, so I'm using it conservative measure to uh, have a, a little bit lower PE ratio. Yeah. So it's the average of the industry, of the silicon uh, industry. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, Amar, did you have anything? Um, yeah, have you been able to look through the history of the company on how it's managed to become a much stronger player than AMD? and whether that competitive advantage is likely to maintain as you go into new market segments like AR and VR. Um, yes, yeah, certainly this is a doubt. And um, we see that um, because uh, NVIDIA is the first one to develop the graphics card, so it, it has a larger market share. And certainly AMD is catching up, but uh, because AMD has so many uh, different um, sectors in their company, so like, GPU and CPU, so there's um, a diversity of resource. For a while, NVIDIA can focus in their own um, products. And also, um, NVIDIA have a, um, put a lot of resource in their uh, um, employees. So in times of crisis now, so they didn't uh, lower the salary of their employees, so rather they asked, and they increased the wages of their employees so I can see that it certainly will boost the morale and also help them to develop better products. So I can ask a follow-up. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Omar. Um, you know, we're trying to limit it to about two, three questions. Uh, quick, quick, if you can do it quickly. Okay, how did you get the $10 discount for coronavirus? How did you reach that $10 figure? Um, because the, the coronavirus have held production. So uh, to be conservative, I just like the $10 to be better reflect what is happening. Yeah, so I um, just kind of make $10 to deduct to make it more conservative, yeah. Great, thank you so much, Yang. All right, moving on, we have Siraj and Brant from Rhode Island.
Can everyone hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Hello, my name is Siraj Sate, and I'm a senior at East Greenwich High School. Hello, my name is Grant Way. I'm also a senior at East Greenwich High School. And together, we're here to pitch Thermo Fisher Scientific. Hmm, let me go check out how my college fund is doing. Oh no, the market is down. How am I gonna be able to pay for college? Let me call my financial advisor. Ring, ring. Hi, this Hi. is Brent Way at BlackRock. How may we help you today? I need a stock that can help me pay for my four years of college right now. Well, we have just the perfect stock for you. Thermo Fisher is a world leader in serving science. A leading manufacturer of laboratory technology, Thermo Fisher's extensive delivery capabilities and powerful consumer network have attracted over 400,000 customers. By employing both business-to-business -business and business-to-consumer models, Thermo Fisher meets the needs of research facilities worldwide. Thermo Fisher operates in four main areas, laboratory products and services, life sciences solutions, analytical instruments, and specialty diagnostics. These areas include products such as reagents, genetic sequencing technology, mass spectrometers, and coronavirus test, fit, test kits, respectively. However, one can't properly understand a stock without the context of its industry. Thermo Fisher Scientific makes both laboratory disposables, which include pipette tips, and laboratory equipment, which includes gas chromatography. Together, the two segments contribute to the laboratory technology industry's 5.7% projected annual growth rate between 2018 and 2025. And as developing nations only continue to become more disease aware, and consequently began to demand more laboratory testing, that growth is only forecasted to increase. Although the industry's <laughs> annual growth of 5.7% cannot be attested to one company, Thermo Fisher has played a major role. A large reason for this is because of its incredibly wide economic moat. Comparable to the moat of King Arthur's Camelot, Thermo Fisher defends its profits with three main protections. The first is a vast product line which only keeps increasing as Thermo Fisher adapts to the needs of its customers. Next is a dominant market position, which Thermo Fisher has established through strategic acquisitions and partnerships. The third is stable recurring revenue streams that allow Thermo Fisher the financial flexibility to function effectively as a company. Since there are only a few companies, but many suppliers and customers in the laboratory technology industry, we believe that the bargaining power of customers and suppliers is low. For this reason, we also believe that the intensity of competitive rivalry is low, as well as the threat of substitutes is very low. Moreover, we do not believe that the entry of new companies is any threat to Thermo Fisher. This is because the barriers to entry within the laboratory technology industry are very high, as the industry is highly dependent upon human and physical capital. I don't know about uh, this, but I'm very fond of nursery rhymes. So when I think of Thermo Fisher, one song keeps playing in my head. The wheels on the revenue bus go round and round. It's not random. Thermo Fisher is incredibly powerful in generating revenue. The drivers of this revenue bus include innovation, scale, and acquisitions. Thermo Fisher Scientific is developing products with unprecedented levels of accuracy and convenience, and has established a presence in new markets in the Asia Pacific region. Additionally, it is well positioned to maintain its profit levels during the coronavirus pandemic because of the increased infectious disease testing capabilities it gained from its acquisition of Quiagen. Now, for what you've all been waiting for, the money. Focusing on the key metrics of profitability, growth, and liquidity, Thermo Fisher excels in all three categories with a 44% gross margin, a 15% net margin, and a 13% re return on equity. It is abundantly clear that the company has optimized their pricing and cost models. It only appears that they will continue to do so in the future, as we project that the company's revenue will grow by 8% annually for the next five years. Even in situations of financial hardship, such as the current recession, Thermo Fisher is well poised to deal with its outstanding obligations, or it possesses a debt to a bit to ratio 
of 2.2, as well as a current ratio of 1.9. I know projections aren't the most fascinating thing, but there's a few that we really want to call attention to. Thermo Fisher has a 24% upside potential compared to the measly 8.1% of its competitor, Danaher. Moreover, Thermo Fisher also boasts a 27% EPS growth, while Danaher can only claim 8.1%. Together, these two factors indicate that Thermo Fisher is a favorable investment and coupled with a PE average that is comparable to its uh, industry average, it looks to be a strong competitor too. Now, companies aren't risk-free, and sadly, Thermo Fisher is no exception to that rule. Given the need for safe and secure laboratory technology, it is possible that regulatory compliance issues may arise or class action lawsuits may emerge. Thermo Fisher also relies heavily on its distributors to deliver its products to consumers, so a disruption in the distribution network could lead to financial harm. Equally concerning is the constant need for technological innovation. Bottom line, if Thermo Fisher cannot adapt to meet the current needs of its customers, then its sales will plummet. However, by building new partnerships and maintaining a high code of ethics, as well as supporting an ecosystem of entrepreneurship, Thermo Fisher looks favorably cushioned to withstand future risks to its profitability. Overall, the DuPont analysis between Thermo Fisher and Danaher, a similar sized competitor, confirms the superiority of Thermo Fisher. Although Danaher has a low, higher profit margin than that of Thermo Fisher, it has a lower return on equity, mainly because it has a lower asset turnover ratio. Since Thermo Fisher has low leverage, its return on equity is more sustainable, and is thus the better investment. Recognizing that Thermo Fisher is the better investment, it's important to quantify by how much. That is reflected to us in one magic number, the target price of $407.60. As Thermo Fisher's current share price is $328.70, this target price signifies a strong buy. Beyond the quantitative analysis for this target price, the qualitative analysis also supports this figure. Thermo Fisher Scientific has a strong foothold in emerging markets, widespread brand recognition, high profitability, and a smart acquisition strategy. As companies become more developed, they will be more able to invest in healthcare, which will increase the demand for laboratory technology. Additionally, the company's industry-leading brands include Thermo Scientific, Applied Biosystems, Invitrogen, and Fisher Scientific. And the company's revenue, net income, and earnings per share have all increased annually for the past five years. More importantly, the company has recently acquired a pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturing site and a viral vector manufacturer in its quest to become a one-stop shop for laboratory technology. In one final effort to convince you, we would like to share a quote that exemplifies why we chose Thermo Fisher Scientific. The key to success is consistency. And in all aspects, Thermo Fisher has demonstrated remarkable consistency. With both sustainable and significant growth, it has and will cater to the needs of citizens, corporations, and governments worldwide, extending its profits into the future and beyond. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Tim, did you have any questions for Siraj and Brent today? Uh, I'm curious, how much of the revenue comes from outside of the U.S.? So about 50% of the revenue is from North America. 25% uh, of the revenue is from Europe. 22% is from Asia Pacific. And 3% is the rest of the world. In the second question I had, as far as their um, supply chains, where they're getting all their materials, you know, there's all this talk of, um, supply chains being disrupted and uh, wanting everything to come from the U.S. or, or from another country in particular. Um, what, how is that risk? How do you view that risk? Is that a, an issue for Thermo Fisher or do they get all their supplies domestically? So since uh, their laboratory instruments are relatively complicated, um, m many of them are made in the United States since they were uh, require uh, high amounts of human capital in order to understand and manufacture. 
these analytical instruments. As far as the reagents, uh, many chemical reagents are made, uh, derived from petroleum and the US has a large source of petroleum. So they come from petroleum refineries, uh, which are uh, located, uh, a lot of which are located domestically. I'd also like to add that there is somewhat of a risk if the distribution network gets disrupted, as we can observe from a 10% decrease in their analytical instruments category. That's because it was heavily based in China and because of the coronavirus pandemic, travel has been significantly restri restricted. And consequently, uh, there has been a drop in revenue in that area. However, um, it, in its other segments, in the life, seg uh, life sciences solutions, it has actually recorded an increase um, in the first quarter relative to uh, that of last year since uh, there has been a lot of uh, academic, uh, governmental and industry research regarding the coronavirus as um, people are trying to uh, find vaccines and treatments for it. And this increases the demand for an analytical instruments such as liquid chromatography, which is very important um, to analyze uh, viruses and uh, determine the efficacy of vaccines, as well as uh, personal protective equipment in laboratories. Great, thank you. Excellent, thank you. All right, last question. Andy, did you have anything for Siraj and Brandt? Uh, yeah, guys, uh, great job. Uh, really like your presentation. Uh, the uh, report that you had prepared talks about the one of the investment risks is the reliance on their distributors, their third party packaging delivery. Um, could you talk me through that? Where, where are these uh, distributors located and, um, you know, how much is that going to impact their their business uh, right now with the uh, coronavirus and and a lot of the constraints that we have here in the U.S. Definitely. So, obviously, there has been a hit because their distributors are located around the world, and as a result of that, it's often hard because of the newfound travel restrictions that have been placed for Thermo Fisher to deliver some of its products around the globe. However, there is definitely still the ability, even though it might be restricted for distributors to operate with Thermo Fisher, work together, collaborate with them in order for Thermo Fisher to deliver its products. And as there is an increased demand, distributors are more incentivized because Thermo Fisher is providing them with more business and to take them on as a priority. And as such, they are able to distribute their products worldwide. And since many of their products are essential during this coronavirus pandemic, um, that they will have less limitations, such as the transport of uh, personal protective equipment for laboratories and instruments that are essential to uh, finding a solution to this pandemic. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, all right, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Sarab and John from Virginia. Are you guys ready? Yeah, I'm preparing a presentation right now. Okay, so do you guys see it? Yes. Perfect. All right. So, okay, so we'll start now. Hi everyone, I'm Sarab, this is my partner John. We're juniors from the state of Virginia and the stock competition today is a buy. Okay, is there an issue on John's part? We believe that Environment is a strong buy and are signing at the target price of $360 per share. We believe that Environment has a strong business with patent protection and is an excellent position to take advantage of future global health trends. Furthermore, the release of two misleading studies by the American Heart Association has plummeted the share price to three year low, making it the perfect time to buy. So what is Environment? Ebiome is a healthcare products company. It used to be heavily focused on the artificial heart, but it is now transitioned to heart pumps in the heart recovery sector. And it does this through a signature Impella device. It's one of the world leaders in the heart recovery space. And this is shown by the fact that it was used over 300,000 times in 2019 alone. In Ebiome, the company is a very innovative firm. This is shown by the fact that it holds five exclusive FDA approvals, along with 653 patents with 541 patents pending. So now that I went over the business, let me go into the product a little bit more. So the Impel pump is a percutaneous ventricular assist device that is used the percutaneous coronary intervention procedure or PCI. Now, I know that's a mouthful, so let me go into a little bit more. 
So a PCI is a procedure that is supposed to treat blocked arteries that are blocked by things like plaque. So while a cardiologist is working on the heart, trying to kind of, kind of clear up those arteries, the heart is actually unable to pump during that time. So this is where the PVAD or impella comes in and the impella basically temporarily retains the heart's pumping function while the real heart is out of action. So in effect, this makes it a backup heart. So uh, PVADs and PCIs can treat or prevent cardiovascular diseases such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, and cardiogenic shock. So the main competitor to impella is a device called the intraaortic balloon pump or the IEPP. So the question here is what makes impella better? Well, there are two reasons. The first reason is that impella has been supported by years of real world data and rigorous scientific research to simply convey more benefits than the uh, IEBP. And these benefits include greater quality of life, less time in the hospital, and greater cost effectiveness. In an excerpt of this research is shown below in the box below from the uh, journal American Health and Drug Benefits. Also, there's no surgery required. It's all in the cath lab, which means that there's less uh, complications than implementation of the impella. And finally, to top all of this off, all impella products are patented or patent spending, which provides a solid economic low for a biomet against its competitors. Now let's take a first-hand look into how the impella pump actually works inside of a patient. What we're watching is the impella 2.5 and impella CP, the two most popular variations of the impella. It makes its way to the femoral artery, which you just saw, where it's then placed inside of the heart. Now that it's inside of the heart, it's going to help pump and circulate blood with this little mechanism you see in the top right corner of your screen. And it helps pump the blood to the major organs and arteries, acting as a backup heart, as Rob just mentioned. So let's look at the industry macro overview, which we believe is going to be the core driver of future demand for Impella. So this is going to be demographic in nature, and it's going to be becoming explosion of elderly population in the U.S. and abroad. Let's look at some facts first. According to the Population Reference Bureau, the population of people over 65 in the U.S. alone is expected to grow by 18 million people by 2030. And this population, according to ARP, is supposed to be 20% uh, of the overall U.S. population. It is actually supposed to outnumber children by 2030. Also more broadly, according to the UN, the total world population of people over 60 is supposed to surpass 1.5 billion people in 2030. So what does this mean for Impala and Abiomed? Well, if you were older, you were generally more susceptible to cardiovascular diseases. This is shown by the fact that 80% of the people, 65 to 79, and 9% of the people over 80 have some kind of cardiovascular disease. And really, people who want to treat or prevent cardiovascular diseases are effectively uh, Abiomed's market. So these are demographic factors will lead to an increase of 20 million people uh, in by 2035, and those in the U.S. who have some kind of cardiovascular disease, it'll also lead to doubling of costs as well. These demographic factors show that the macro story around the demographic factors, the, all of these show that there is truly an unprecedented opportunity for a biomet. More importantly, its investors to prosper from. These are some graphs that show the macro story. Uh, figure one is a growth in the uh, amount of cardiovascular, the amount of people that have cardiovascular disease as a percentage of U.S. population. Look at the red line. And the second graph shows the uh, growth, the global growth of people who are 60 years or older by region. The most important catalyst for a biomed stock going forward is reducing negative publicity from the two American Heart Association studies released in November of 2019. These two studies showed that the impella pump was more expensive and led to worse medical outcomes for patients than its competitors. As a result, a biomed saw their impella sales and stock price plummet in the following months. However, both studies are minted or slanted critical data that even the publisher later expressed skepticism in an editorial, as you can see at the bottom of this slide. In both studies, impella patients were more likely to have pre-existing conditions, did not include data about impella patients about pre- and post percutaneous interventions among impella patients, nor did it include data about balloon pump patients who were escalated naturally slanting the data set against the impeller before it could even be analyzed. In February of 2020, a new study of over 20,000 patients was released that reaffirmed the impeller's safety compared to their peers. Finally, it's important that we reiterate that the impeller pump remains the most studied heart pump in FDA history, with seven post-market studies and two more currently in development as we speak. The odds that this device could suddenly be found dangerous are minuscule. The second catalyst for a biomed stock are the new innovative products currently in development. In the most recent learning calls, a biomed CEO talked about the praise the Impella 5.5 was receiving from surgeons, calling it, quote, what we believe surgeons have wanted for the last 15 years. The Impella 5.5 is significantly smaller than other models, but it's more powerful and can even provide real-time feedback through the Impella Connect device. Other products we believe will drive future top-line growth are the Impella ECP and the Impella BTR. So as I hinted at my UN data before, the majority of elderly population growth will in fact come from abroad. This means that, that Abiomet has to have the robust international strategy to capture those gains. And Abiomet does have a robust strategy. 
This is shown by the fact that international revenue grew by 36.8%, and they've seen double or even triple digit growth in specific regions. However, for the future, if I'm really focusing on Asia, Pacific, and Europe, so this is where the majority of elderly population growth will be. Hence, this is where the real opportunity will be. And targeted countries include Italy, Australia, India, and Israel. In order to actually penetrate the targeted countries, if I'm using a site strategy in which they introduce and parallel into select hospitals in order to encourage diffusion to the rest of the country. So if I'm in its truly fantastic financial statements, one of the most eye-catching things is that if I'm in it has no debt with over $400 million in cash in their balance sheet, which greatly improves liquidity and solvency. Their uh, operating income growth was terrific with high growth of 20% year over year. They do a great job deploying their own capital with high return on equity and return on invested capital ratios. They also do a great job in their profitability sector with high profit margin of 31.2%. Now, those three metrics that I just said, uh, profitability, ROE, and ROIC, they all demolish the respective industry averages. If I have also invest heavily in their shareholders with high treasury stock growth of 25.4%. And finally, free cash flow, one of the most important metrics an investor should look at, grew by 21.1% year for year. All of these metrics show that if I bid this very well on the profitability, liquidity, and solvency fronts, making it truly a gem that investors should not miss. In our valuation model, we believe that the negative publicity surrounding the two American Heart Association studies will receive, and a biomed will be able to enjoy the double-digit top-line growth they had beforehand. In our model, we believe that revenue will go at 24% for the next five years, very similar to the rate of growth before the release of the two misleading studies. Using these numbers, we were able to arrive at an intrinsic value per share of $360, or an upside potential of over 140%. Now, as honest investors, we have to acknowledge that there actually are risks to this uh, stock. So we identify six core risks. The most important risk is the risk is that the risk from is that the, the publicity, the bad publicity from the uh, the scathing HA studies doesn't fade, and this would permanently damage a biomed's reputation in the medical community. Those are the risks that the FDA doesn't approve of biomed's proposals, and this would uh, lead to a setback in research. Uh, healthcare reform, the implementation of a single payer healthcare system would lead to uh, lower prices being charged for impala products, which would obviously cut into margins. Currency fluctuations can lead to uh, lower profits from abroad. COVID-19 could lead to the delaying of surgeries, which would obviously lead to less demand for impella from a biomed. So that, uh, well, that would obviously lower revenues. A recession would lead to less people having the means to pay for PCI, which would uh, lead to, uh, by extension, would lead to less demand for impella and herd buy. In conclusion, a biomed is a strong buy, not just for growth investors, but also for value investors. A biomed has a wide economic moat protected by patents. They also boast a clean balance sheet with no debt and a long history of employing capital that far outperforms their competitors. Finally, a biomed is in an excellent position to take advantage of future global health trends, along with their share price hitting a three-year low, makes it the perfect buy for investors with a long-term horizon. Now, before we take questions, we really want to emphasize the importance of a biomed's work. My sister, Saurabh's aunt, and his grandfather have all suffered from painful heart problems. When you are investing in a biomed, you aren't just picking a company that would generate great future free cash flow or return on equity. You are picking a company that is saving and changing people's lives, one heart pump at a time. We will now take questions from the judges. Celeste, I'm going to go over to Andy. Andy, did you have a question for Saurabh and John today? Yeah, could you repeat the uh, last part of your presentation there? Somebody in the family has uh, actually used this uh, product? Uh, my, my sister and Saurabh's aunt um, and grandfather have suffered from pain for heart problems. I don't know if they've used this product though. Okay, how did you come up with the, the stock that you guys presented today? Um, so I was the one to actually first stumbled upon the stock. When I like to screen for stocks, I like to look for ones that are trading 10 to 15% above their 52 week lows, because I find that eliminates a lot of my downside risk. Um, then I took a look at a biomed's uh, business, made sure I could understand it. And then I looked at their valuations to make sure that they were in line historically, looking ahead of future growth and compared to their peers. When Saurabh and I first started preparing for this competition, we ran some stocks through an initial screener and a biomed did not come up. Um, but then when we did a deeper dive into some of those companies and we didn't, uh, we didn't like what we were finding, um, I suggested the idea to Saurabh and he paired it with some fantastic macro health research um, along with the additional benefit of timing. So it seemed like a great pick. Okay, I won't hog all the time. I'll let the other judges ask a few questions, but uh, great job. It's a really technical uh, explanation. You guys made it very easily uh, understandable. So thank you. Thank you. 
Agreed. Uh, Amar, did you have any questions today? Well, um, the the assumption on on growth going forward for this company, I think you're using 24% uh, growth for the next five years, which I think you said was based on the growth that they've seen prior to the recent uh, adverse uh, publicity. Um, but um, wouldn't the base of their revenues now be much higher than it is five years ago? Um, and with a higher base of revenues, wouldn't you expect the growth to moderate? Um, so that's a fair assumption to make, but as Sarah mentioned with the macro research, we see a lot, um, we see a lot of the population getting older and more susceptible to these cardiovascular disease. This is a company that is going to continue to expand into markets and that is going to continue to be demanded as long as the elderly population continues to explode. So Rob, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I, I just agree with you uh, since, yeah, but I, I think that this, uh, this has been widely reported that, that I think this, um, this demographic trend is probably going to be one of the most powerful trends of our generation. And I think that uh, will make the growth increase, if not uh, stay the same. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's, Tim, did you have um, anything to add? Sorry, I was on mute. So one quick question. You, you um, mentioned you're, you're adding a, a 15%, in one of the Excel sheets, 15% premium on the PE ratio. Just curious what, what that was a result of. Um, so I was responsible for making the model. Before the misleading studies came out, the market tended to um, value uh, a biomed at a higher valuation compared to their peers due to the exclusivity of their product and their wide economic moat. And we assume that when the publicity received, negative publicity goes away from these bad studies, that the market will regain that um, lofty valuation. Okay, makes sense, thanks. Excellent. Great job, guys. I'm going to be handing it over to Arjan and Avanov from California. Last, but definitely not least, Can everyone see that all right? Yes. Are we ready? <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Nina Fomalapali. And I'm Arjun Guta. And we understand that this is a tough time for everyone, but you guys should still definitely be excited because we know a way to make you guys rich. Since today, we are pitching Applied Materials. Applied Materials is a global leader in materials engineering solutions that specializes in manufacturing for a number of markets, from wafers to solar cells to the smartphone displays that you guys probably use every single day. Applied is involved in an incredible number of essential industries. Applied has also recently begun doing corporate deals uh, for various teleconferencing and tech symposiums, putting them at every single phase of their industry. In fact, these very online presentations are one example of the limitless applications of semiconductors in today's digital environment. They are always pioneering new designs and they push the industry forward from research centers, such as the one in the top right corner. And they're always ranked among Fortune World's most admired companies year after year. So we're very excited to see what the future holds for Applied. As semiconductors are used everywhere, the semiconductor industry is booming, growing over $480 billion in the past 60 years and is expected to grow another 6% this year alone. An example of this growth is Taiwan Semiconductor or TSM, which recently released that they're constructing a $10 billion facility in Arizona. And this capital will end up cycling throughout the chip industry. In particular, Applied Materials has a fairly large portion of the total industry, reaching 3.3%, and dominates the semiconductor equipment manufacturing industry with an industry leading 18.8% market share. Their services also extend to manufacturing displays, optimizing equipment, and automating factories through their applied global services segment. Their grasp on the industry is a direct result of their technological prowess, as they constantly implement newer technologies that they are pioneering, including convoluted neural network applications, rapid thermal processing, and advanced machine learning techniques. Recently, amidst the COVID-19 outbreak, some analysts are predicting that the entire industry might decline by five to 15%, so Applied is poised to maintain its revenue with its diverse income streams and continued product development. 
So we rank applied stock as a buy to hold with a 15 to 18 month valuation of 88.33. One factor that went into this valuation is the number of diverse and emerging markets that they supplied. For instance, in 2020 quarter one revenue, uh, 8% of this revenue came from display and adjacent markets and 25% came from applied global services, which are still two relatively untapped markets. Applied essentially has a direct investment in each of their clients as their client success supports their revenue. Additionally, Applied has a long history of acquiring related organizations, which is emblematic of an expanding business that's poised to take an even more dominant market share in future years. This valuation also accounts for their technological innovation, as Applied's continual focus on research and development proves their commitment to long-term growth over the short-term future. Thus, we believe that all of these factors will boost their future value considerably. So this video here shows the Bacini Pegaso assembly system which is applied to revolutionary new method for crafting solar cells. As you can see, their software tracks each cell as it's moved for total product accountability. And this process is a physical example of their so-called monopoly as their global services division designs the systems that you see here and their engineering division supplies the required machinery. So thanks to Applied, this right here is the future of solar. Moore's law, which is a widely accepted theory in the semiconductor industry that computer processing will continue to grow more efficient is beginning to end. To combat this, Applied is pioneering their new playbook, which will eliminate the need for inefficient cobalt and zinc while revolutionizing chip architecture, such as with their glass packaging system shown to the right. Additionally, the uses of semiconductors have yet to hit a ceiling. In fact, recently, many newer fields, some of which we've listed here, have all become viable applications and Applied is at the forefront of each of these innovations. The semiconductor industry offers a number of competitors though Applied holds its ground with an aforementioned 18.8% leading market share. None of their competitors participate in nearly as many sectors as them. KLA Tencor, for example, only takes part in equipment inspection, while Applied operates in display markets, equipment manufacturing, and other similar sectors. Their key differentiator lies in their intensive focus on research and development, as last year alone, they spent over $2 billion, or 15% of their yearly revenues on developing newer tech, such as the new playbook. We want to categorize Applied as a wide moat company, as they operate in large markets with over 20 acquisitions, reaching over $10 billion total. Actually, they're in the process of acquiring Think Silicon as we speak. In addition to these acquisitions, they maintain loyal relationships with customers, as well as a large market share, which new entrances can't compete with. This lays a foundation for the low Porter's forces rating shown in the upper right in the spider chart, as there are few quality substitutes and Applied holds a large bargaining power, as no company can truly match their quality. Also, backwards and forwards integration into their industry are non-factors. Applied Materials uh, had a 2019 revenue of $14.6 billion and a quarter one EPS of 0 0.8. Considering the first quarter rebound in revenue and price, we decided to perform multiple valuations to determine exactly how undervalued COVID-19 was up to apply. And while the relative valuation method yielded an intrinsic value per share of 7.2x, DCF model resulted in 6.7, and both outlined a very solid upside potential and a high margin of safety. However, uh, actually we settled on a targeted PE multiple of 22.6 over the next few years. But despite this positive valuation, we decided that the DCF model was not a reliable source for our short-term target price, which again was 88.33, since that reflects a seven-year growth trend, while our target price reflects the next 15 to 18 months. To help fully explain Applied as a company, I'm going to give a brief technical analysis of their stock price and its biggest historical fluctuations. Applied stock, with ticker AMAT, displays a basic peaking pattern with two large highs in 1999 and 2018, which were caused by the dot-com bubble and industry inflation, respectively. As shown in the middle chart to the right, the investor panic caused by the coronavirus rapidly drove down the price, ending its 2019 rebound. Yet just since we began this report alone, investor confidence has already begun to return, with Applied up $17 from its low in March. Moreover, when comparing Applied to another industry leader, NVIDIA, it's clear that Applied stock, um, which is shown in the dark blue line, is far more sustainable during crises than basic semiconductor companies, as its manufacturing sector will be very beneficial considering the current economic volatility. Here are some of the leading revenue drivers. Applied's global outreach plays a major role in their overall profit, with 32% of their revenue last year coming from China alone. Applied's income from Asia is expected to make another 6% jump next year as companies abroad continue to implement newer applications. 
As mentioned, Applied's willingness to spend on new technologies allows them to consistently be first to market. As seen on the chart to the upper right in blue, Applied's research and development budget is annually higher than that of their rivals, ensuring future growth. Additionally, Applied's customer first mentality offers a valuable and tangible asset as it helps them build a trust between their clients that new competitors simply cannot match. They offer field service engineers, for example, whose unique services help establish relationships, leading to reorders and brand loyalty. Moreover, Applied Materials' diverse income allows for more immunity to some of the regular market fluctuations, as no individual market trend can control that year's income. However, we still need to take into account some of the risks involved as well. The cyclicality of the semiconductor industry and the fluctuating demand for chip embedded products leads to inconsistent revenues, and Applied will have to expand other industry holdings to maintain a steady income. Furthermore, the sheer size of the industry presents a major obstacle to Applied as they're forced to constantly seek competitive advantages. In addition, Applied's vast product line makes them susceptible to smaller, more specialized competitors who can slowly eat away at their market share. Finally, the international future of the industry is in question amidst all the political turmoil in recent years, such as the tariff wars and the COVID-19 outbreak, as almost all industries are struggling to maintain consistent demand and revenues. So after speaking digitally with Applied's Head of Investor Relations, Jay Iyer, uh, on behalf of Applied CFO, Dan Dern, we gained lots of insight into the company's priorities. For instance, uh, Mr. Iyer and Mr. Dern told us that their focus on R&D is a result of their belief in ensuring future growth over short-term success, as they believe this to be a key principle that will differentiate Applied in the long run. As previously mentioned, the COVID-19 outbreak has naturally shaken investor confidence, but due to Applied's diverse business structure and the importance of semiconductors in this digital era, they're poised to maintain a good position. Also, he explained to us how, although their competitors sometimes support higher EPS or PE ratios, Applied's diverse market shares makes them less susceptible to yearly fluctuation, establishing more consistent growth patterns instead. And finally, Mr. Iyer attributed much of the company's previous success to the assortment of industries that Applied is involved with, as he stated that they always benefit from the growth of their clients. Applied Materials is led by CEO Gary Dickerson, who has had 35 years of experience in the semiconductor field at the helm of Varian Semiconductors and his unique planning and execution has earned him a spot as one of Barron's world's best CEOs three years running. Alongside his senior VP, Gino Adiago, another proven figure in the semiconductor field, Applied continues to reshape the industry as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks you guys. I'm gonna hand it over to Tim. Did you guys, did, Tim, did you have any questions for Arjan and Abinov today? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I'm just curious. I'm trying to understand if they compete by having a wider product set, or is it are they kind of competing on price against their competitors? Yeah, so we highlighted that this might be that they have a wide line, but Applied Materials essentially provides all the equipment that any client would ever need to completely build out a full factory. And alongside this, with their Applied Global Services segment, they actually give them and sell them strategies on how to automize the equipment that they've just bought. So with this, they're actually just locking in their clients into Applied's ecosystem, as there's no reason for their clients to even consider other options, as they're getting everything they would ever need from one stop. And they even go another level with all of their customer support, such as field service engineers, where they actually offer services on how to use some of the complex equipment that they're buying. And they've actually developed their own technologies that actually track their client's products. And this is so that they can protect their client's intellectual property. So essentially, this is just applied taking another step to actually take care of its clients. And with all this wide line, they essentially just create a complete monopoly as there's no reason for any of their clients to go to anywhere else. And uh, just if you want to, that's the literal application, obviously, of their diversity. But if you want the financial evidence of its success, actually, Applied had its earnings call just recently on May 14th. And they missed earnings by, I think, negative 2.3% surprise. But uh, another big competitor in their industry, ON Semiconductors, reported on May 9th. And uh, their surprise was negative 33.3%. So Applied's diversity in this field just essentially protects them in times like this, which is why we think that having a wide line is actually 
very good in terms of their assets for the future. Yeah, especially this is shown as last year in quarter four, uh, while the entire semiconductor industry was on average down 33% on their revenues, Applied was able to maintain a growth of 11%. So with all the diversity, even in a not as great of a year for semiconductors as 2019, they're able to maintain steady growth, which is what investors really like to see as they're not really locked into one specific type of thing, such as KLA only doing inspection or LAM research only making tools. They're able to kind of expand into everything. So they cover the entire industry. So they're not kind of trapped by any unique trends. Excellent, thank you. Andy, did you have a question? I do. Um... You guys uh, point out that they get a large uh, percentage of their revenue from China. And I was curious to know how the uh, trade war uh, played out in 2019, or do they have any sort of way to kind of mitigate their, you know, liabilities going forward if there's another, you know, trade war, if, if Trump decides to go that way? Um, wh what, what did they do in 2019 relative to the tariffs that were in place uh, temporarily? Yeah, of course. So the tariff wars are breaking, broken down into mainly three major aspects as we see it. So the first part is more on the short term end as companies during the tariff wars would not want to spend more than they would usually have to. So this creates like a short term effect of lower demand. And this leads into the second stage of if companies in China start to actually incorporate their own products and producing their own equipment, this can have more long term effects on applied demand, but this hasn't happened yet. But the third point that we, we like to emphasize and that a lot of people don't really focus on is that during the trade wars, after the economy, especially of the US was falling, the Federal Reserve actually lowered interest rates. And with this, a lot of applied clients actually had extremely heavy pockets as they borrow way more money and have to pay back way less. So this actually incentivizes applied customers to make any large purchases during the trade war when interest rates are low because they can take more money and have to pay back less. And this plays directly into what Applied would want as they sell large equipment and they can supply equipment for entire factories. So actually the trade war actually benefits Applied as this is a perfect time for a lot of these companies to actually spend on fully automating their factories and a lot of big things like that. So in essence, the trade war, even though there are some shorter term effects that a lot of it is caused by just general investor panic, a lot more benefits actually applied as these lower interest rates allow their customers to just buy bigger and more amounts right now. And uh, can I just add one quick thing? It's essentially, uh, if you, I know you asked one of the other groups about the calls to bring back manufacturing to the US. And so applied, even if some of their factories are currently located in China, uh, in the past two years, I believe they've opened four research centers, most of which are in Albany, New York, and uh, some are right in our backyard in Santa Clara, California. And as we've said, research and development is such a huge part of Applied's intrinsic value because uh, their future valuation is going to be dependent on it. So even if the calls for to bring labor back to the U.S. do end up succeeding, Applied will be well poised to deal with this new environment. Yeah, and just one more quick thing is, even with all the political turmoil and all the lower demands right now with the COVID-19 outbreak and still some of the tariff wars, in quarter two of 2020 this year, Applied was actually still up 12% year over year on their revenues. So this just shows how even when a lot of the foreign markets are kind of collapsing right now and not at full strength, with all their diversity and constant research and development with making their technology ahead of the game, they're able to constantly stay ahead of their competitors and maintain steady growth. Excellent, thanks guys. Uh, well, that concludes our presentations today for our 2020 Global Stock Pitch Competition. Um, I'm gonna have Abhinav and, there you are. I was gonna say, unshare your screen for me. Um, I just wanna say I am I'm so excited uh, that you guys all did so very well today. Um, I'm thrilled to see the, the progress and the growth and for you guys to be able to present this well is truly exceptional. Um, I'm gonna take a few minutes with the judges. And so I'm gonna hand it over to James and uh, James is gonna introduce our guest speaker and uh, we'll be back. We have a lot to discuss and talk about, but James will go over everything with you uh, as soon as I meet him. There you are.
Yep. Thanks, Christine. And, and thank you to everyone who presented. Wow, what, what, what an amazing global stock pitch competition that we just had. Um, the caliber, the professionalism. I just want to give you guys another congratulations. Um, amazing, amazing job. Um, it's with honor. Um, um, actually, before I introduce Paul, um, let me um, let me give an overview of of so Christine and the judges will will um, will convene and we'll we'll talk now. I'm sure it'll be an incredibly difficult decision. Um, the the prizes today, um, as many of you are aware, is is um, fifteen hundred dollars for the winning team, one thousand dollars for the second place team, and five hundred dollars for the third place team. Um, these prizes were generously uh, sponsored by Investors Business Daily. Um, I believe we have Arusha and John on the call from Investor Business Daily um, who, who sponsored the prizes today. Um, the winning team um, teams will also receive um, Apple AirPods. Um, all groups will receive um, certificate in their global pins. And um, the winning team will also receive a uh, 30 minute meet and greet with any um, YIS board member or advisory board member of their choosing. Um, so that's about um, 70 uh, successful financial professionals that, that you can choose from. Um, so exciting prizes ahead and I'm sure you're all on pins and needles to, to hear the results as, uh, as am I. Um, I want to introduce um, a credible professional um, a, a mentor to me, a friend, uh, Paul Smith. Paul Smith is the managing, or he um, previously was the managing director of Hermitage International, after which he was the head of alternative funds or hedge fund administration for HSBC, after which he was the chairman and CEO of Asia Alternative Asset um, Partnership. Um, and then afterwards, he was the managing director of Asia Pacific, after which he was the president and CF, CEO of the CFA Institute, um, who, who we all recognize as, as the global body of financial professionals. Um, Paul, um, if you have followed his LinkedIn over the past couple of years, has traveled um, amazingly throughout the world to visit CFA societies in, in countries all around the world. So with that, I turn the time over to Paul and am honored to have you as our speaker today. Thank you, James. I, I hope everyone uh, uh, can hear me. It's uh, a real, real pleasure to be with you all uh, today. I can't tell you how impressed, I know everybody says that, James just said it, but, but that was, boy, was that an impressive competition. Uh, I'm only so sorry that we've had to do it remotely like this, but uh, it has demonstrated if uh, anyone my age needed to be told that, that you are, you are technically a very, very uh, proficient generation in terms of handling uh, new technology. So thank you for everything that you've done. Uh, it was truly inspirational. And I think, I think the first thing to say is, you know, the clue is in the title, Young Investors Society. This is about, this competition is about investment as opposed to speculation. And what I loved about um, today was that I think um, we all feel that this pandemic isn't necessarily throwing up new trends, but it is accelerating, rapidly accelerating trends that were already in existence. And I think the companies that you all chose were evidence of that, how we're moving forward into whatever this new normal is going to be. You know, medical products companies, gaming companies, high-tech companies. Uh, this is the future. And as young investment professionals, you more than anybody uh, understand the way that this world is evolving. And I think that's a theme that I wanna come back to, that it's the youth of today who are gonna to own tomorrow. And I think, through uh, the exhibition that you've just given us, um, that gives all of us immense hope for the way this world is going to operate um, uh, into the future. And I think, uh, you know, I think that's uh, an important thing to say is that the world, the world has enough capital, but it doesn't have enough skilled intermediaries to move that capital to where it needs to be 
to keep our planet sustainably growing, uh, to make sure that wealth is more equitably spread than it's been uh, heretofore, uh, and that all of our citizens have a happy future. And that's really what investment is all about. It's trying to, it's trying to make sure that we mobilize the world's capital resources in a productive way for all of us. And I came away from uh, today's competition feeling very strongly about that. that um, and I hope that you have been uh, inspired by this competition as well to show you just how exciting our industry is, but also how much there is to learn about investment, that it's not a, uh, a straightforward science. It's something that you really need to work at. And so, you know, that's a, a second message. Obviously, you're going on, hopefully, to complete your education. Um, think about that. Uh, I know a lot of you will be doing business degrees or uh, economics or finance degrees of one sort or another. But think about the world around you. To understand the world around you, you also need breadth. So don't forget that when you're plotting your educational course, and I'll come back to that uh, uh, a little bit later, uh, don't just drive yourself solely down a finance route. Think about how you can complement your finance skills with other types of activity that will give you the breadth of intellectual capacity to truly understand the world around you. And we need that now more than ever, obviously. Secondly, as you get into your college career, your university career, um, uh, if finance is where you want to be, uh, as James said, think about starting uh, the CFA, the Chartered Financial Analyst Qualification, while you're at college. You can do level one uh, whilst you're at college. Levels two and three, I think, are best left until you're into the workforce. But, but think about doing level one whilst you're at college because it will give you a great foundation and uh, I'll come back to this a little later as well. It also gives employers an understanding that you're committed to this profession. The great thing about the CFA is that it teaches you critical thinking. And I think that's so important in the age in which we live. Uh, as James said, I've spent a large part of the last few years traveling around the world. And I know that seems strange in our sort of lockdown world at the moment when when is that going to come back? But I can't impress upon you enough the insight that you cannot find out about the world. You cannot be a great investment professional by sitting behind a desk and looking at a screen all day. You need to get out there and you need to experience it. Partly because so much of what we're fed through the news wires and through social media isn't particularly accurate. And I think that's an insight that um, as young professionals, you do, need to, uh, you do need to take on board that there is no substitute for direct experience. And again, that comes back to the comment that I was trying to make about keep your education as broad as you possibly can for as long as you possibly can, because I think that will help you understand the world around you better. And that's what being an investment professional is truly about. When, when we think about the investment professional of the future, it, it's such an exciting career. And I can't, I can't um, uh, urge that upon you enough. It's such an exciting career because it combines all these various elements. Yes, you have to be technically gifted and uh, the CFA gives you that, but you also now uh, have to have uh, data science skills. You have to be something of a programmer. You have to be able to collect data, manipulate data, analyze data, but you also need some of these soft skills that I talked about earlier on. How do we understand the world around us? How do we understand cultural nuance? Uh, how do we understand what works in certain environments, the way people are thinking about their lives going forward? So um, as you make your choices in life, try to think about those three aspects that you're going to need to be a great investment professional. Technical, um, uh, data sciences and soft skills as well. And as you move on into your university careers, your college careers, um, remember that you need to keep building that CV. Uh, Young Investor Society is a great start. Never let that drop off the way that you present yourself to future employers. 
If you can join your college investment club, for instance, so many uh, universities, particularly in the United States, uh, have investment clubs, be an active member of that. Try to get your CFA charter. What employers are looking for more than anything else is your commitment to this profession when they make that first hiring decision. They want to know that you've understood what you've got. Everyone's got smarts, but that you're really committed to what you're trying to do. When, when I think about my own journey, I mean, I think there are, you know, there are several lessons to learn. Um, I mean, firstly, it's, it's not where you start that counts, it's where you finish. And I think that's a very important lesson. The, the YIS, uh, CFA, are truly agnostic in terms of who you are and where you've come from. They're global, uh, in, in YIS's case, a, a, a global uh, competition and a global learning format. The same with the CFA. It's agnostic as to uh, color, race, creed, uh, economic background. And I think that's really important. This industry is open to all. The second thing uh, I'd like to sort of impart from my own career is, is I, I trained uh, as an accountant uh, originally. Most people when they're in their uh, late teens, early 20s, don't really know what they want to do. So I tried to, I tried to accomplish one thing really, which was to get the best name I possibly could onto my CV. Why? Because I think it's really important to try and uh, work in an environment that is going to train you well in the first four or five years of your career. And the better companies, in my case, it was Price Waterhouse, the better companies will invest in you. And you really need that in that sort of 21 to 25 year old range. You need to get that training into yourself to teach yourself good disciplines, good habits, uh, good ways of working. The second thing about joining um, uh, really high quality organizations is that you will develop a network within those organizations that will stay with you for the rest of your life. People that you join with at 21, you make very good social bonds with, but you also will never work with a cohort of such smart people. As you get on in life, actually oddly enough, um, you, you find that the people that you rub shoulders with become less and less impressive, not more and more impressive. It's the people that you start with that are really uh, the best pool of talent uh, that you'll find. Um, the other uh, point I'd like to make is a, very, is a very simple one. I myself have five children. Um, they're all slightly older than you are. They're all in the age range 28 to 32 now. But the one thing I did tell them when they started to go out to work was to remember that most people out there are actually quite lazy. You may not be the cleverest person in your organization, but you sure can be the most hardworking person in your organization. And I think your commitment to YIS shows that you've already got that in your DNA. And I can't stress it enough. Most people in the workplace are clock watchers. They're not really dedicated to what they do. And no matter how smart you are, you can compete on that level alone. And your employer will really value you for that commitment and that energy that you bring to the job. So work hard. It's a very simple, it's a very simple um, uh, piece of advice, but it's amazing how many people forget that. Um, also, Remember to manage your own career. I mean, I, I, you know, I said at the start that, that you, you know, the, the first four or five years are very important to be in a, an organization that's going to train you. But ultimately, you have to be responsible for who you are and for moving your career forward. And the simple rule of thumb there is um, that uh, you must always remember to keep learning. If you have spent six months in a job where you feel that you have not learned anything, it's almost certainly time to move on. And I really mean that, particularly in the modern world where uh, you know, the behavioralists will tell you that we're all gonna have four or five different careers over the next 40 years, that it's, uh, it's, it's, that's the way of the world, that, that where you train, um, uh, you'll adapt those skills four or five different times during your life as your career progresses. 
So continuous commitment to lifelong learning is really important. And, and that really feeds into how you manage your career. Keep thinking every six months, look back on the previous six months and say to yourself, have I been learning? Have I been moving myself forward? And if you have, then you're probably in the right place. But if you haven't, then think carefully about what your next step should be. Partly because if you're not learning, you're obviously competitively falling back in the pack. But also if you're not learning, your employer probably recognizes that as well and will be valuing you less and less over time. So that's a very simple rule of thumb. Finally, um, you know, take your time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm 60 years of age. I've been working for 40 years. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been fortunate in my career in many ways, but I'm still doing it. <laughs> I still get up in the morning, put my suit and my tie on. It's a long, long race and it's getting longer and longer. You know, we're all living longer. We're all healthier for longer. And, um, you know, there is no rush. Try and remember that. I know we all want to be on the beach at 30, having made lots of money, sipping margaritas and, and, and having a good time. But that, that really um, isn't open to many. Um, that's a very narrow set of the population that, that get to do that. Most of us um, keep working for decades. So um, pace yourself. Remember that you don't need to do it all in the first 10 years of your work experience. Um, and also remember that because you're going to be in the workforce for 40 years, you need to be humble because things will happen during that period to knock you back, to set you back. And you have to keep going. Um, uh, James, I thought, mentioned a great word earlier on. Resilience is the key to long-term success. Uh, and these are very basic traits. Uh, everybody wants to believe that they're touched by God and they've got genius. But if you've got resilience and hard work and an average amount of intelligence, your career will last for decades. So really, that's um, all I have uh, for you. I wanted to sign off with one plea, which is um, at the heart of everything we teach at the CFA is ethics. And uh, I urge you all to try to ponder a little bit about um, business ethics. I, I always boil that down to one simple thought that ethics really uh, are about putting your client's interests above your own. If you always put yourself in your client's shoes and ask yourself the simple question, if I were my client, would I be happy with the way that I am treating myself? If you think about that, ask yourself that simple question, then you will always steer yourself correctly, whatever walk of life that you're in, whether that's a, a medical doctor, a lawyer, or a financial professional, always remember that what we do is for our clients, that our own benefit is a side product, a byproduct of doing a good job for our clients. And if you can always remember that, again, you'll have a very long and prosperous career because those material rewards will come to you if you set your client uh, and your client's best interests as being the most important thing that you can think about as you go to work every day. So thank you for listening to me. Good luck in this competition. I'm so glad I'm not a judge. Um, they have the devil's own job in terms of, of trying to separate you all. Uh, I really mean it. I, you're, you're the most impressive bunch of, of young people. It's a great honor and a great privilege to have participated in this. Good luck with everything that you do in your careers going forward. Uh, and if I can be of any help in any way, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. James, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was just inspiring and, and beautiful. Thank you for taking the time. It's such an honor to have you today. Um, okay, so I have been sent the results and I will announce the winners, the, um, the big moment we've been waiting for. Um, <laughs> and the, the feedback I got was this, is, this was incredibly difficult and a huge congratulations to all the teams. Um, 
Okay, so drum roll, please. Um, honorable mention. Um, we would like to um, give an honorable mention to um, a biomed, uh, Sarab and John from Virginia. Third place was Thermo Fisher, presented by Siraj and Brant from Rhode Island. Well done, Siraj and Brant. Second place was Lift, presented by Ethan Wilk from Arizona. And first place of the 2020 Global Stock Pitch Competition, competing from hundreds of teams down to the final one, was Arjun and Abhinav, Applied Materials from Westlake, California. Congratulations. Um, Arjun and Abhinav, you can unmute yourself. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity. This was probably one of the like most fun I've ever had doing any project like this. And I actually learned a lot more, especially from like Arjun, we each worked on different parts of it. So that was really cool. And I just wanna thank you guys for this opportunity. Yeah, to all the teams. You guys, you guys did such a great job and congratulations to all the teams. Um, what, what an amazing year, what, what amazing presentations. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll sign off. Thanks for everyone for participating. This has just been a wonderful evening and afternoon. Christine, do you have anything to add? I just wanna say that the judges had a really difficult time in coming up with our winners because they're just the caliber is amazing for high school students. I mean, you guys did a really excellent job. You guys should all be very, very proud of yourselves. I mean, I don't, um, I don't think anyone would question you guys being in the world of finance. So great, great job guys. Well, thanks everyone for being here. And with that, this concludes the stock pitch competition and the 2020 year for Young Investor Society. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm.